Oh, yeah. So, as I find where my agenda is. Okay. I'm going to call to order uh, with my glasses. The Tuesday, September 4th, <coughs> City Council regular meeting. Uh, first thing I need is approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Now we need consent on the minutes from August 7th and August 14th. I move approval of the minutes I presented. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, we start every meeting uh, with our public comment phase. Those who wish to speak are welcome to come up to the mic and speak. If you have not already signed in, please sign in with Colleen's sign-in list at the podium. Does anyone wish to say something? Ma'am. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Sherry Russell. I'm here for Columbia Bank and it's 107 Sunset Boulevard. Um, I believe I did email the city councilors um, on my concerns and also uh, I think I CC'd Jason Chamorn. Uh, as the traffic flows for Sunset Boulevard, we've noticed a very large increase. In fact, it's um, gone all the way down to the highway where it's hard to access. And I think my biggest concern is people that are coming from Tolavana side, uh, they're, not, they're not slowing down, they're not stopping, and they round that corner at the bank. Um, I've seen some really close calls. I think that it's just a matter of time before we see somebody um, either struck, um, pedestrian-wise. Um, there's a lot of activity happening on that corner now that uh, the Pelican's open. Uh, having outside um, feeding, you know, they, they have a lot of commotion, music, and that corner's gotten really busy. So uh, as I've noticed more and more traffic flow, traffic issues, people trying to make left-hand turns, they're not able to get onto Hemlock, which backs up traffic. I would really strongly suggest having somebody either come out and look at it, but I think a three-way stop um, with stop signs, I think just making somebody come to a complete stop, even if they don't fully stop, it's gonna save somebody's life. Um, rounding that corner, uh, it's just a matter, to me it's just a matter of time and it's not something I wanna watch. Uh, but I would strongly, if you guys could take a look or send somebody out and just maybe um, review what you think would happen. But I think it would be helpful um, to look at that uh, as, a, as a safety for our community and for our uh, people that are coming to visit. So anyway, I won't take any more time, but please, please take a look and whatever I can do to help um, think maybe that might be the best a solution to, a, to an issue that could be resolved. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Sherry. You. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm Mary Postwaite. Uh, my family owns property on 3543 South Pacific, just south of the Tolavana Inn and Tolavana Park. Um, we've owned this property since 1943, and I'm re representing my family and seven other families in that area who also own property. And we want to bring your attention to uh, you of the feral, feral rabbit invasion that has multiplied to an intolerable population in our area. At any one time, I can count up to 15 rabbits on my property alone. During that picture, there are 19 eating away uh, at my property. Um, the neighbor lady does feed them, and there are times that there's 20 to 25 rabbits on my property because of the feeding twice a day. There is destruction of lawn and gardens from the manure and the urine. The manure and urine on the grass cause a rise in acidity, which kills the grass 
and other plants in the uh, area. Um, they destruct and chew on wires. They dig large burls into the ground that I understand a gentleman just south of me is now filling with cement to try and keep them out of their yards. They are digging into the dune that is our protection from the ocean and that we are mandated by law to, to uh, maintain. <clears throat> there is increased maintenance costs because of erosion issues from the rabbits and the manure and, u and uh, urine and also the chewing of wires. They get into their house and pull the insulation out of the uh, house area. They dig holes and have rabbits uh, baby rabbits under the house. The health and safety concerns that we have is that feral rabbits, urine, and manure carries both bacteria, which is E. coli, and viruses known as the Henta virus that causes respiratory diseases in human. The manure is so thick on the property, the yard is unusable for my grandchildren. I spent 30 minutes one day sweeping it with a broom so they would have a small patch of grass to play on. Two years ago when we remodeled, I spent $2,600 to have the lawn leveled and planted. I'm going to have to spend another $1,200 this fall to have it reseeded because of the damage the rabbits have caused. We've owned this property for 75 years and I've never had a fly problem. We now have bullflies all spring and summer that get onto food if we're having picnics in the yard or into the house. They come for the manure. I don't believe that the satisfactory solution to this is each homeowner trying to trap rabbits. I believe it's the city's responsibility to take over and help out somehow. Um, it was the irresponsibility of two citizens for turning the rabbits loose in the beginning, and they need to be eradicated, either by humane society trapping them, or the county trapper trapping them, or some other lethal uh, arrangement that can be arranged. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? <coughs> no comments? Okay, thank you. That closes our public comment phase. <clears throat> We're moved to our public hearing and ordinance. Uh, first item is public hearing. I am opening the public hearing for consideration of ordinance 1807 for the purpose of amending Cannon Beach Municipal Code 1722 limited commercial zone and chapter 1784 variances. I'll ask uh, Mark if he'll give us a staff report. Yes, this is coming to you for public hearing tonight after a couple of work sessions and a previous public hearing on a broader set of amendments uh, related to housing. Um, this is pared down to two amendments. One has to do with um, building height in the C1 zone for certain types of multifamily dwellings, and the other amendment. Uh, addresses off-street parking for certain types of multifamily dwellings through the variance process. Um, both of these are intended to uh, encourage uh, development of multifamily residential housing in the C1 zone to address some of the affordability and availability problems we have in our housing market here. The, um, we've talked about this at, at some length prior, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. The one thing I want to mention that it has come up previously and it uh, came up uh, this afternoon in a conversation I had with a citizen was uh, under both of these provisions, that is any development that would take advantage of either of these provisions would go through uh, two public hearing processes. On the building height part, um, multifamily dwellings are a conditional use permit in the C1 zone, so anybody taking advantage of that would by necessity be going through the planning commission for that conditional use permit. The off-street parking variance part of it would also be a planning commission action item. So anybody taking care advantage of that would be 
before the Planning Commission, both for the conditional use permit and a variance, probably combined at the same hearing. And multifamily dwellings in Cannon Beach all go through design review. So those, both of those public processes are, are, uh, are remain unchanged and would be um, anything taking, any development taking advantage of this would be subject to those two public processes. If you get to uh, the point of a, well, this is set up for a public hearing tonight. You should take testimony. If you get to the point of uh, considering an ordinance and amending what we've given you or adopting what we've given you, there are a set of findings which I've attached, which is basically a set of reasons against the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance that would explain why you're adopting this. Um, if you do get to that point, it's a, you can do it in one or two motions, but the, the motion would be adopting this ordinance based on the findings presented or the findings modified, however you want to handle that. But you do want to include the findings in the motion. If you want to um, amend this or uh, change the language any, you can either do it on the fly here or give us direction and bring you back a clean copy with whatever amendments you uh, want to uh, put into this. Uh, either way can work. Uh, if you are making just clarifying amendments, I would recommend that you conduct the hearing tonight, get that um, through, get through that, and then at your subsequent meeting, you can just adopt a clean copy of the ordinance um, without any further testimony, if that's what you'd like to do, and uh, it would be a pretty brisk matter at that point, fairly quick. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> any additional correspondence on this? There's one piece of correspondence that I think was included in the packet. Is there any uh, member of the public wishing to comment on the proposed ordinance? Not any. Please sign in and state your name and address like record, like you're normal. <laughs> Robin Rinsley, 587 North Laurel, Cannon Beach. Um, Mayor Sam and Council. Um, my concern is that most of the C1 zone is located downtown, and there's already an issue about density and parking there. So um, my suggestion would be to really think about this because it will change the complexion of what is already a concern. Um, and you can do two, uh, three stories with the height that is allowed at this time. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment? <coughs> Jan. <laughs> Jan Siebert Warmond and my husband is also with me on this one. He usually is. Dear Mayor Sam and CB City Councilors, and the address is PO Box 778, please do not allow our height regulations to be weakened in our C1 zones for housing that is not verifiable, lasting, affordable workforce housing. We do not need more long-term rentals which can be rented by wealthy people. If there is nothing we can do to guarantee these rentals would go to low-income Cannon Beach working folks, why would we risk losing our village character by allowing potentially every building in our C1 zones to add another story. This is not an acceptable risk. There is no guaranteed benefit to Cannon Beach from this proposal, and there is a guaranteed possibility that people will take every advantage of these rentals and charge top dollar. What is to stop that from happening? Bit by bit, we are losing our village character. For real affordable housing, 
we could possibly make an exception. But for this, this is a mistake. Please think of the unintended consequences of loosening these regulations. Who will really benefit from this in the long run? Not our community as a whole. Why have we lost our focus on real affordable housing and are instead caving in to wealthy developers in Cannon Beach? Thank you for listening. Jan and Wes. Thanks, Jan. Anybody else? Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. Greg Swedenborg, 188 West 2nd, uh, Cannon Beach. Um, I really didn't plan on speaking tonight, but I, I did have some questions and I wanted some, some validation. Um, as you might imagine, I'm boning up on a few things uh, that I met the, around the city and, um, and discussions that have taken place over the last year and, and longer. Um, and my first question was, there seems to be a lot of a feedback on this and the, the letter in your packet from somebody um, that, that flighted in your packet was referencing one particular project, if you will. And my understanding is that project is in R3 zoning and not C1. So I, I understand that the staff was asked to, by council, to come forward with uh, uh, affordable or workforce housing. There is a difference there, but um, uh, solutions in the downtown corridor. But I'm, I wanted some clarification if this was tied to that one particular project and the variance is requested for that because if it's truly in R3 zoning, I would actually support it. Um, I don't consider that being part of the village. And if you look at the three C1 sections in town, um, according to the GIS mappings that, that are available online, uh, that is Hemlock Corridor and what I refer to as the M&M building or the mall and, you know, as you go down the, down the way and then in Midtown and again a little patch in Tolavana. I would be opposed to this ordinance and being adopted as, as recommended in C1 zoning. However, if, if this goes back to that particular project, um, by what I understand from the project, would double the uh, original four to eight units um, by granting this variance. In that case, because it's R3 zoning, I would be in favor of it. And I just didn't know if there was some clarification there and, and wanted to get my point across on that. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Anybody else? Okay, I will close the public hearing. Um, question on the, the R3 zone. The, Project in question. Yeah, this, the Sealark Apartments is in the R3 zone, and that has, has already been approved both by the Planning Commission for a variance and the Design Review Board for the design. So that doesn't, uh, that project does not benefit by these changes uh, one way or the other. Right. Other question was about the height. Uh, in the C1 is already at that height. Would that allow? No, that, well, the, the maximum building height for a pitched roof in the C1 zone now is 28 feet. The proposal would change that to 32 feet for multifamily uh, residences subject to these re restrictions. Right. That kind of mimics an approach that's taken in the RM zone where you allow, where it also has a 28 foot maximum building height except for hotels in the, in the RM zone which are allowed to go to 32 feet. That was the, um, 
and it's not exactly analogous, but that was the language we were following there. Okay. Yeah, it's it's 28 feet to a, to a flat roof with, with a ladder to the pit. It's just 32 feet. But the testimony was that um, that we already allow three stories. Can 28 feet be, can tw three stories be built within 28 feet? I've not seen any three-story buildings that comply with the 28-foot height on a level site. Now, on a sloping site, you can get often three stories on the downhill side um, on a, and still comply because our building height is measured from an average. So if you kind of think of the average of the low side and the high side, you're ending up measuring from the middle of the first floor. But on a flat side, I've not seen any compliant, height-compliant three-story buildings. How high would the ceilings be in a thir third story if it was at 28 feet? Mm. Pygmy. <laughs> huh? Pygmy. Yeah, okay, that, 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 they, they, I don't see how you could get eight foot ceilings plus ceiling joists in a, and comply with that. Um, you might get a, a real tiny space in the loft on the third floor with sloping ceilings as long as it met the average. Mm -hmm. There's an average that you can do in a place where you have sloping ceilings. So you might get a a smallish space on the top floor that I've not seen. Uh, I've not seen that in practice. You also have to take into account the uh, floodplain. Mm -hmm. You have to build up high enough there, especially in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the floodplain. You know, we're, we're not measuring from the first floor. We're measuring from the dirt. So um, anything that requires that you elevate the building, like floodplain, is um, is a factor here. Okay. So even with a 28 foot allowance plus the four foot for a pitch roof. Uh, downtown, where you have an elevation above the floodplain, you're still going to have a very low ceiling in the various apartments. Yeah, they will not be lofty ceilings, but I think you'll get the, the intent was to see if you can make sure you can fit in the code minimum, which I don't, this is not something I would write down, but I believe it's seven and a half feet. Yeah. I have a, a question. Um, I'm assuming the purpose of this is to allow a third story. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I mean, so would be would it be better that we did not deal with um, uh, height, but rather with allowing a third story and then put a minimum ceiling height um, or maximum ceiling height, uh, so that we would indeed accommodate a third story at, in all occasions. You know, uh, whether or not they have to raise up several feet for a floodplain or not. So. If that's our goal, I guess, if, if we're really wanting to make sure that uh, every C1 property has the ability to add uh, affordable housing, is what we're hoping for. Yeah, you can do deal with stories instead of feet. Um, our code is pretty tied into a, a metric using feet because of the way we measure average grade and measure from the grade. But other communities have done just what you've suggested is convert all that to stories and talk about uh, maximum uh, story height so you don't end up with people doing this as a way of getting cathedral ceilings right. and um, abusing it that way. There is a way of doing that, yeah. That would be, I'm not sure that you'd want to treat one zone differently. One of the things about our code that's, uh, that's nice and it makes it easy to administer is that the building height's measured the same way everywhere. Okay. And so Our builders and designers can kind of work with that. Are there properties that you could uh, imagine that would not be able to comply because of that uh, height restriction? C1 properties? Um, yeah, I think any of the, I mean, most of downtown, for instance, is, I mean, most of our C1 zone property almost in most parts of town is pretty flat. And so I, with a 28-foot uh, a height limit, I'm, I doubt that you get three stories. No, what I'm saying, if we raise it, as we're proposing, uh, are there still properties in the in the C1 zones that would not be able to comply and, uh, with a uh, thir by adding a third story? I, I not that nothing that jump out at me. The floodplain issue is is a real issue, but most of the C1 zone is out of the floodplain now with the maps you adopted uh, effective June 20. So that's uh, particularly in the downtown area no longer an issue, with a couple of exceptions, but. For the vast majority of C1 zone downtown and midtown at Tolavana Park, uh, floodplain's not an issue. So I would say, yes, generically, we should be able to get the third story with that additional height. 
Now that doesn't get you, that doesn't answer some other important questions. If you get a third story and some extra units, you still have to figure out how you're going to get the parking there, and that's the, where that parking variance comes in. You still have to get landscaping and a bunch of other things. So there, there may well be sites that, while you could technically design a three-story building on, you may not be able to achieve that for some other reasons, like parking, for instance. I have a question I'm not clear on. Uh, by calling this multifamily, how how is that restricting? What what's excluded? Is is a single? If somebody wants to add a single unit, that won't comply because it's not multifamily. Correct. A single f unit would not fall under this. By the way, right. because of the way we define multifamily. Right. Why would we want to make that kind of limitation? The in, I believe the intent was, or, or the thinking was, is that multifamily housing is a housing type that is somewhat lacking in Cannon Beach and that that was at least an element in our housing problems, the lack of that particular housing type. Um, not the solution to all of those problems, but a, a key to that. So that would be a reason to restrict this to multifamily only and not single family. The thinking there being that single family housing is not in, in as short supply here as multifamily housing is. So if, it, if an existing commercial uh two-story uh, downtown or anywhere in, in a C1 zone, uh, wanted to add a third story, what would they have to do to be considered multifamily? They have to be two or more units in that, let's say that third story that you're adding. So, so yes. a single, adding a single unit wouldn't comply. At, That's, that would, well, be, yeah. That's yeah. another thing I think, well, if we're trying to create more housing, why would we create a limit um, like that? Um, I thought it had to be three or more to be multifamily. Well, it's definitional, so we should, I should be able to figure this out pretty easily. Um, My feeling, George, would be on uh, any single, or an opportunity for a single family allows for a large, large kind of space that would be higher priced, which is the one thing we're trying to avoid uh, allowing that, because that's not technically a workforce kind of housing situation. So if it's in the C1 zone though, I mean we have really limited C1 zone. Uh, yeah. I don't <coughs> you know, I don't see how where it would what how it would exist, where it would exist, I guess, whether or not it's a standalone multifamily or a single unit above an existing commercial, it's still right there in the C1 zone where yeah, but the property do. values in Cannon Beach make that highly desirable, so... Right. It's going to be desirable if it's in the C1 zone. I don't <coughs> care who it's built for. It's going to be desirable, yeah. um, I would think. So whether or not it's a single unit above an existing or a, mul a standalone multifamily, I would think the demand is going to be the same for it. Uh, the people who want to be there are going to be the same people. No, I, I disagree with uh, that. <laughs> In answer to that, that earlier question about duplexes, yeah, we define duplexes separately, so multi would be three or more, not two or more. I'm sorry for that. So we are talking three or more. Yeah, duplexes are standalone definition here. So, yeah, the idea is to get more rental units available, and just having one larger unit doesn't accomplish that. Remember, we started off with this. That the idea was to have, quote, affordable housing, and we ran into all kinds of difficulties being able to identify, manage, administer the affordable requirements without a, a, another bureaucracy to uh, assure that they're affordable. Then include, well, at least in my mind, we still some long-term rentals are still desirable to provide housing for people that live here and work here um, in order to try to avoid having someone just buy it up as a second home, we put in there that you couldn't be individualized condominiums and uh, when we get to it, I would add our co-ops or LLCs or any other form of individual ownership, they must be rented as long-term rentals. So to go an individual unit on a third store over a two-story commercial, um, and provide that by allowing a height increase is just is counter to what we're trying to accomplish. 
You can still do it if you can get by with the height. It's uh, already provided for. What we're, what we're trying to accomplish is create some housing for the workforce, right? I mean, that's our ultimate goal. Everybody agrees on that? Okay. Um, I don't see where any commercial piece of property, certainly in downtown and probably not midtown, somebody is going to opt to put multifamily housing instead of commercial. Um, I just don't see that happening. You know, I, I've been a commercial uh, owner downtown for almost 40 years. Um, I just don't see that we're going to get anywhere with thinking that we're going to get housing. Is somebody going to come and develop multifamily housing in a C1 zone when, when their other option is, is commercial? Well, keep in mind, upstairs commercial, as you well know, is less desirable than Main Street floor level. Third level is going to be even less so. It's uh, and our uh, comprehensive plan encourages uh, residential uses above commercial zones as long as it doesn't exceed 50% of the space uh, of the commercial area. Um, that by itself almost requires that there be probably duplexes over commercial. Uh, increasing the height may allow three or four uh, so rentals. And they, because of the square footage, they will be lower cost than one large unit on the third floor. Yeah. So they, somebody could then, uh, in a commercial zone, um, build commercial on the ground floor and multifamily above. That would qualify? Yes. Do that. As long as there's three units uh, as part of the, of the multifamily. Okay. Yeah, they can do that with the current code, but not with the extra. Right. And the parking variance. Yeah. And that, that's going to be the biggest obstacle, I would think. It's, you know, there's plenty of sky, but there's not much parking. And, and that may, in fact, be the limiting factor. The final analysis is parking. Okay. One thing I should add is I, I talked a little bit to our building official about the this idea of adding a third story to an existing building's come up before, and I, I've never seen that successfully done and I talked to him about it he said that would be hard to approve you're looking at an older building and you'd have to show that it was engineered to support this third story when in fact you can't actually see the stuff you have to evaluate and he, he said you, you wouldn't say it's impossible but it would be the rare <coughs> existing building downtown that could support a third story just grafted onto it what would be what would prevent them from tearing the older building down and starting all over again? That, that's what he was saying. That's the far more likely scenario is you tear down what you have and build a three-story building from scratch because of the difficulty of, of adding a third story to an existing building. And we see that happening in cities all, literally all around the world. The demand is there. Well, it certainly could be happening now, uh, and it's not. Say there, people have the option of, of doing that downtown, um, yeah, but not of going to a third floor. Third floor makes it right. economically and, possible. And and maybe what can continue to prevent that is not to increase the allowable height. And it's not going to be an affordable piece of property, which was our original intent. If it can't be quote affordable, my thought is well, at least there's some more rental units and somebody moves there, it might free up other rental units elsewhere in town, so it, it creates the pool of long-term rentals, but not necessarily and probably not at affordable rates. But if the risk is if people start tearing down buildings to get the additional height, I don't see how a brand new building uh, is going to necessarily be affordable either. So we may not get the intentions we want by allowing this increased height. Well, I, I'm willing to concede that it's probably worth the effort to get some additional long-term rentals as long as we put enough restrictions on there that can't be owned by a co-op or a condominium association. Yeah. I, that was my next question. How does ownership affect it? How are you thinking that ownership has an impact on, on the rent that's going to be charged? Somebody's got to own it. So why would a developer um, treat it any differently than somebody else? Because that's who, that's who initially would likely own it, is a developer. 
Um, <clears throat> somebody buys it with the intention of renting it long term. That defeats some of the objectives, I guess. If somebody buys it just to keep it, that's not a long term rental. It's a private ownership. And the only way they can do it is to buy the condominium or buy the entire block. They're trying to restrict it to individ no individual <coughs> shall be rented. So the concern would be that um, if a developer builds it and then uh, a private party buys it, that that private party is not likely to rent it. Is that what the thinking is? Well, I just thought that's kind of your thing. I'm sorry? I thought that's what your concern was, that somebody, a well, private party, buy it. And no, I, no I, I, I'm thinking that um, whoever owns it shouldn't make that much difference as to you know, how it's being used. Um, it's, it's built for <coughs> a certain purpose. Well, as long as they rent it out and don't move their family right. in there. Right. Yeah. But we, we can't control that. We, you know, we have no control over, over who rents it, right? We're only going to control how high they can build and, and uh, what the parking is going to be. After that, they can rent it to who they want to. Now, there was some restrictions, though, right, Mark, that we were going to put in the other than ownership? Yeah, the, the no condo ownership. Um, That's the only restriction we, that and, we... And no short-term rental permit. Okay. Th those two restrictions. Otherwise, you're correct. The, that owner would be free to rent it to whoever qualifies. Okay, so we cannot qualify the income level, um, the income source, the income, anything. Not through income. this mechanism, no. Which and is our original intent. Right, and that's, that's where we're hearing from, you know, the public is that why do this if we can't? You know, if we, do, we don't know for sure what we're, what we're going to end up with. Um, we certainly could end up with greater density uh, and just more um, vacation rentals. Uh, they might not be short term, but they're their second home basically is a, a getaway home for somebody from Seattle or Boise or anywhere uh, who can afford to have a second home in Cannon Beach and uh, now they've got they've got a place so we did not solve our problem now we have a bigger demand on parking and uh, we take some sky away if somebody <coughs> could come in and rent a unit and pay rent every month and just Keep it for themselves as a second home. Is that? I mean, that, right. I don't see anything that actually prevents that. Right. And, but they can't have ownership of it. Uh, and that's why I would put in the provisions. They can't be a co-op or an LLC where they buy it and they rent it back to themselves. You know, that that gets around that issue. Somebody wants to have it and rent it. Monthly, for 20 years, I guess that's their option. They can do that with other rentals in town right, right. now. And that's what's happening for the most part. That's why we have a, a, the housing shortage we have for our, our workforce is because the rentals are, are taken by people who want to have a second home here, want to have a, a getaway, a you know, weekend getaway. But that, in that case, they buy the home, not rent it. I have, I have a tenant who's renting just like that. And they don't live there full time? Mm -hmm. They use it as a, you know, as their Cannon Beach getaway. And it's just like paying a mortgage, except they don't end up owning the house. No, I, so the, the issue is, does this really defeat our original objective? Say I'm willing to go along with the height increase with all these restrictions, but once you put these restrictions on, you really accomplished the objective. One of the <coughs> um, instigating factors for this whole argument for me was the fact that we have the housing, um, I forget the term for it, where we are going to be able to grant to folks to build low income housing. That is essentially unavailable to us anywhere in town for anybody to, a developer, to come in and say, I want to build some low-income housing, um, some affordable housing. The terminology is really tough around this. Um, so a workforce housing. We have, ever since we started, 
whatever year that was when we started the strategic plan, this has been our number one focus is affordable housing. We have been battling this all the way through to this point. There's nothing left. We've argued every other point and every other thing, every place that we've thought about putting something or um, arranging some way in war order to do it. There's either been no, we don't want it there or we can't afford it or we just can't go any further. This has come down to this point. Now, if we just don't want this, this is fine. I, I'm, you know, I would be willing to go with George and say, okay, this is not, this is too much of a risk to take with uh, the aesthetic that we want to keep within our town. But that means no more, no possible affordable housing as far as I'm concerned. There's no developer that's going to come in here and say, I can only do two stories. That won't pencil out. They're not going to, even with a, a granting that we could give them, it's just not going to happen. Three stories, there is a chance that we'll get somebody that's going to be willing to come in and say, I'm going to make some affordable housing. It's the only place we can do it. So if we're going to say no to affordable housing, fine, we're going to say no to this. That's my, until we can find somebody else who was really willing to come in and grant and pay for it and, and find the locations that I know aren't there. So, that, uh, you know, I, I think that this little, this is a little tweak. Um, I don't see a lot of it happening. I see maybe three possible buildings downtown that this could happen. Sites, um, structures where this might <coughs> happen. The fact that we have a parking issue that's compounds the issue and I don't know how to get around that but that's my that's my feeling on it. I think you know if we look way down the road 50 years down the road we probably are looking at three story throughout Cannon Beach you know we, we're making a decision that will affect the skyline of, of downtown um, if it doesn't get turned you know turned back and grandfathered um, all those properties down there will eventually deteriorate to the point they're going to be replaced and when they are, they will be replaced, I think, with three stories. So uh, I think we need to think, is that something we're willing to accept? Uh, that's, I think, the decision we're making is, what will, the what will downtown look like in 50 years? Um, so. But you're presupposing that uh, the buildings, when they're torn down and rebuilt, would only build to three stories with that criteria. I think they okay, would likely yeah. take advantage, you know, assuming there's demand. Um, you know, it depends what the market is at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would, you know, would assume that um, there would. I, I, uh, I built my commercial property downtown in 1987. And at that time, um, it, there, during the course of construction, um, this whole thing about limiting the height was, was going, be, going through the uh, planning commission and the council. And I was uh, working with my architect and deciding whether or not we were going to add a third story. And it turned out that um, we could have, and the only reason I didn't at that time, uh, even though it, was, it, would, it could have passed, was that, uh, well, two reasons. First of all, it was a little more money than I had available at the time to do the project. Um, but also, it was that this whole thing was coming down the pike where they were going to be limiting, and I would have been one of the only three-story you know, projects downtown. And my architect didn't want to do it. This is Tom Ayers. Uh, he didn't want to do a third story uh, because of um, you know, his reputation in the town. But I think I would have done it uh, otherwise if it hadn't been for those factors. So I, I do think that you know, people will uh, <coughs> build a third story. Um, Even though it has to be multifamily. Well, multifamily doesn't mean it's workforce. All it means is you have to have more, more three units or more. No, but I'm, my point is, is that, is that, if that's the only available option to put the third story on, you think people will do that? Um, they won't be able to do a three-story commercial building. No, and they wouldn't want to. I don't think. You know, it's, I don't think there's going to be demand for that. Um, yeah. You know, they, they certainly would not if there's no demand for those for those units. But I'm assuming that there would probably be demand for those units. Because we're not talking about having to limit your what you're charging for them. You know, we're, we're talking about 
uh, rendered them a market value. And I would think that to add that third story would, um, even if you couldn't keep it rented full time, it would pay for itself one way or another. Um, the additional cost to build that, uh, and you're going to be able to rent it often enough to, to afford it. So, so I do think that we, we, would, we would look at um, a, a third floor above downtown, you know, in the long run. As buildings get replaced. Yes. And it will happen. Do you want to chime in? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> let me start out by saying that I am no real estate expert, but I want to mention some things that I saw in my last job, and it was something that we didn't see coming, and that was that the uh, residential property became so valuable that it became more valuable than commercial. And again, usually you, you, if you go from commercial to residential, you're down zoning. But um, we found that it was actually the opposite. And we didn't find anybody coming in and trying to build anything, you know, quote, affordable. Um, people were taking over mom and pop hotels, uh, you know, like buying six units and putting one house, you know, a mega house up. Um, we had a hundred unit um, Holiday Inn. Um, and it was bought, torn down, and they put up 32 condominiums for about two and a half to three, three and a half million dollars each. Um, so the kind of things that we, you, you would normally think that would happen, you would think that would go ahead and become another resort or something. But the residential value becomes so high. And then um, another part of it was that <clears throat> we had a lot of ranch houses. And um, over time, the, uh, you know, the, waterfront sites were taken, but there was, you know, we were on an island so that there was the bay view. And, you know, people didn't come in and buy a lot and tear down their house. They, they bought three lots and tore down three houses. And then they built these, you know, huge houses, you know, out at the end of the, the, um, the, uh, the islands. So what, when we're talking about, you know, uh, real estate values and r uh, residential property that if you have a place, and I think that, that, that Cannon Beach has got the potential to see that kind of a situation, that, you know, something, uh, and I was, I was planning on bringing this up later, but something you, that we need to think about is um, how, you know, what is it that you want? What kind of commercial do you need to support the residential? And then what kind of um, controls do you want to put in to make sure that all of a sudden, the market turns that completely upside down from whatever you were thinking. So um, buying multiple houses, uh, and again, when I was talking about the uh, the ranch houses, they were maybe 50 feet high at the peak, and then there was like three of them in a row. Well, this guy came in and built a box out to the setbacks, and this guy did too, and then all of a sudden this house, which was a standard house, um, was overshadowed. We actually had to get into, you know, depending on the width, you had to go actually bring your house in, those kind of things, which we call light and air. But um, we found that all of a sudden the house was on either side and the old house was still there or buying two lots. So I'm just saying that, you know, with some of the things in the conversation I'm hearing, that can happen. And so the idea that everything's going to stay the way that it is or if a, um, a small hotel or something becomes available, that it's somebody's going to put another small hotel in there. Um, residentially, somebody might come in and say, okay, that's going to be my big house. So, so the current zoning is going to do. Well, we could, it hasn't happened here that I can think of, but you could uh, buy two adjoining lots and build a large house. We don't have a... In a commercial zone? Oh, not in a commercial zone, no, in a residential zone. Okay. So one thing that happened that, that they did wrong, they thought they were doing it right. They wanted to get rid of uh, commercial. And so they said that anytime you change the use, it reverts to residential. Well, that was exactly the wrong thing to have with that market. So um, anybody that had commercial was dying to go ahead and uh, bail out and then sell it to somebody who wanted to get into a house. I mean, you know, major restaurants we lost everything for a single house. Well, so. uh, Bruce, I appreciate your, your 
comments, but they just don't seem relevant to the issue at hand. To the C1. Well, we're talking, yeah, the, the issue with the C1 and the idea that, you know, the properties will stay what they are. I mean, they, what we saw was that if somebody had a commercial property, uh, maybe in downtown, they would probably, there was a point that we reached that it was more um, viable to turn that into residential. But than it was to keep it as commercial if you were going to redo it, or actually to buy it. We, people buying viable commercial operations because they could turn them into residential. And I'm saying what happens is when the property values get off to what you would normally assume they are. But, but we would have, the, ch the zoning would have to change in order for them to build a residential and a commercial zone. A permitted use is a residential use above a commercial property as long as it doesn't exceed 50% of the square footage of no, the commercial property. No, no, I understand, but we were talking to you during this time that the, that, um, it, the whole dynamic changes once you hit that point, the commercial is less valuable, that people are finding ways to go ahead and convert that one way or the other. So I'm just saying it can't be seen to happen. I don't know if it would happen here, but um, it was very similar community as far as property values, uh, demographics, you know, all that. It wasn't happening every place. It was happening on the island. Just make sure I, we don't buy a commercial and convert to residential. Well, you know, that's part of it. It's also, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think Sam makes a good point. You know, we have reached the point to where uh, we've we've looked at everything, and we've come down to this is the is the last straw as as far as taking any action toward affordable housing, at least anything within our immediate control. Um, <clears throat> if we would go uh, allow you know a third story downtown, um, you know one of my th thoughts is you know if you took away the sky, you know from a, a third of the sky, you know um, higher, I guess um, it would create much more of a corridor feel. If we would have third floor, then I would want to see a further setback. I would want to see those houses push or those buildings push back further, so you wouldn't create so much of a corridor effect. Um, I think that would, you know, takes it would mitigate some of the loss of sky if you push the place back, you know, a few feet further than than the buildings that are uh, currently there and allowed. In fact, our most of our buildings downtown are way too close to the street um, already. And we got such narrow sidewalks. Is that the doable? Um, interesting. No, I like that idea, but we're not addressing that here tonight. Yeah, but it, that could be something we yeah. could put into the zoning or the setbacks within mm -hmm. the C1 zone. Yeah, the C1 zone setbacks now are that there are none except adjoining uh, residential property. Right. So we could have that for any future. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or you could say if you're going to three stories, the third story has to be stepped back by these setbacks, something like that. Yeah. It gets to that light and air thing that Bruce was talking about. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of that concept. You see that in, I don't know, big city codes sometimes. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I was waiting to get done. I would say that would almost guarantee that you would take out any possibility of affordability for the units. If you're required to build that. Yes. Yeah, because you're probably losing at least one unit, maybe two in the process. I would say so. <clears throat> if you set back five feet, you'd just be taking five feet away. Through, through the whole width of the project. Five by 50, okay. yes. 250 square feet. Right, but as far as the, as the housing on the third floor, you'd just be taking five feet away from where the unit is. It would be the it entire would, width of the... Right, it would certainly create a higher cost per square foot um, if you can't use as much of your lot um, as somebody else. Well, are we really gaining anything through this? No. Might lose something, actually. <clears throat> We're rolling the dice. <laughs> well, I still, 
I still sense enough doubt here that I'm, I'm not comfortable with going, stumbling right into it, I guess. We have a, a difficult problem with the affordable housing. Um, my hope was that this one would allow for someone to do something that had some properties in the downtown area. Um, but the danger sounds like that the risk of other folks that would not do what we like downtown, the, uh, the aesthetic of Cannon Beach is, t is there um, with a very slim chance of getting affordable housing. I might see more long-term rentals available. I'm not sure this provides enough security versus increasing the risk. Okay. Um, yes, hearing all that, I would say let's table this. Um, Can I make uh, give you kind of an update on where I, this might go? Um, I'm preparing a memo for my successor, kind of outlining some of the big issues that are coming up in the year, the next year or two. And one of the things we need to do is update our affordable housing, and, or excuse me, our buildable lands inventory. And um, I, any of you who are on the Planning Commission when we did this in 13, 2013, I think was the last update, we're tight. The city of Canada Beach's city limits and urban growth boundary are bound, drawn pretty tightly compared to say uh, many other cities in the county. Um, so there's not a lot of slack there. And that's been fine, but we're getting to the point where the number of uh, vacant lots left, and in particular, the number of vacant lots that are suitable for multifamily dwellings is getting small. And at some point, and I don't think we're there yet, but we are go we're approaching the point where we're gonna be in this bind where we either, we will have a choice and it won't be do nothing. It'll be either more density um, in town or annexing and expanding the urban growth boundary. And those will be the choices you're faced. So you, I don't want to see the city paint itself into a corner on this. It, it obviously gives you more flexibility if you're kind of out in front of this. So I'm kind of set the, uh, the, the next person up to push this forward so that you still have some choices here. Um, I was talking to Bill Kabeisman, your land use attorney, about this. And he was explaining that in Eugene, another city he works with, um, developers there are basically forcing the city to approve projects because of needed housing because they're in a similar position on a far larger scale, obviously, where they, they don't have any available land for certain types of housing and developers of those housing types are, um, you know, really have the city over a barrel where the city can't say no and can't really impose very many conditions on their projects either. Is, is this because of the state requirements for certain types of housing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're have subject have. to those, um, on obviously on a smaller scale obviously subject to our limitations of land and water availability, but we're not immune from those. And I don't think we're in that position yet, but we don't want to get in that position. And the problem is, is that we're moving in that direction slowly. So I, I, I've asked the, the next person to look at this buildable lands inventory carefully and think about how that's going to play out in housing, but it is going to have some implications and you'll end up having to revisit this type of discussion again. Um, but if you post, postpone it too long, the longer you postpone it, the narrower your options get. I had uh, someone question me today, um, and th this would be a question for the council, is if we might want to revive the Affordable Housing Committee and ask them to do some more research for us, more along these lines of things that could solve our problems, knowing with what Mark has just said. Um, um, I would be supportive of that, having been a member of it. Um, you say you would or you would I would. I mean, this isn't going away, as Mark pointed out. It's only going to get worse. Right. And, I mean, yes, there are some very tough choices that meet, need to be made. And I, I agree that perhaps increasing the height in the C1 zone isn't aesthetically uh, popular. But, as Mark pointed out, you know, other choices may be much less palatable. I guess my advice is just stay on top of this. Don't let it languish because you'll find yourself with a, a far uglier situation and no real real choice to make. Could you so. inquire with the folks from the Affordable Housing Committee yeah. to see if they would be willing to 
uh, revive and do some more research? I can. Um, in terms of timing, the countywide affordable housing study is, I don't know, where we're three or four months away from that concluding, I'm guessing. I'd say that's fair, Mark, yeah. Yeah, so sometime this fall, that should wrap up. That might be an impetus for um, pumping some air back into our committee and um, looking at that fresh information, see if that gets them moving forward. I'd actually like to see the results of that yeah. published before maybe we yeah. move forward with that. I think that would, because, you know, we, may, we need, we're going to need some thinking outside of the box, obviously, because any of the stuff that we've tried so far just doesn't seem to work. Well, there, there's certainly no urgency to pass this tonight. Not tonight, no. And I, I think it's been good discussion. Um, you're right, the problem's not going to go away. This still may be one of the building blocks in the overall housing issue in Cannon Beach. We shouldn't just it out, but I don't think there's any urgency to move ahead with it at this point. No, I just want to make sure it kind of stays on the front burner was my... my and like the Planning Commission uh, suggested, there is still a ability through variance for <coughs> somebody to do something. It's just harder. And that's how the uh, Sealark apartment reconstruction was approved through your, just your conventional variance and review processes. Have we uh, gotten any feedback from our new city attorney about whether or not we put some teeth into who can rent these places and how much they can they can make? We haven't posed that question to her yet, um, so no, we haven't. That I think that's a, a critical issue, is that uh, if we knew we were, we were creating workforce housing, um, I'd have a whole different you know attitude um, about you know doing it, but because we don't know that, uh, we just hope that. The market forces seem to be working against that. Well, other than buying property and building it ourselves. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, there's more of an opportunity if we were to continue with the uh, uh, RV park. Uh, tiny homes. Many, the tiny homes is many development where we can actually begin to control what's right. done there, but we still need legal support on that. Okay, let's move on. Effective discussion. Let me find which piece of paper I need. No, don't. Proclamation. Ah. Consideration Proclamation 1808, 1808, declaring September 1723 as Constitution Week in Cannon Beach. The council wishes to adopt the proclamation. An appropriate motion is order in, in order. Um, I don't have an introduction, Bruce. Do you have this is, um, We've done this almost every year I've been involved, so yes. it's a just to come um, kind of reinforcing the Constitution of the United States and how we appreciate it. Um, usually we vote on the motion, uh, and then I'll read the proclamation. Okay, I, I move that um, we adopt Proclamation 18-08 for the purpose of designating the week of September 17th to the 23rd, 2018 as Constitution Week in Cannon Beach. I'll second it. Any discussion? Colleen? Council President Benefield? Yes. Councilor Benner? Aye. Councilor Olsby? Yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. Mayor Seibel? Yes. Whereas, oh, yes, whereas the Constitution of the United States of America, the guardian of our liberties, embodies the principles of limited government in a republic dedicated to rule by law, and whereas September 17, 2018, marks the 231st anniversary of the framing of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention, and whereas it is fitting and proper to accord official recognition to this magnificent document and its, memorable, and its memorable anniversary and to the patriotic celebrations which will commemor commemorate it. And whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States of America designating September 17th through 23rd as Constitution Week. Be it resolved that I, Sam Steidel, by virtue of the authority vested me in as Mayor of Cannon Beach in the state of Oregon, do hereby proclaim the week of September 17th to 
through the 23rd as Constitution Week in Cannon Beach and ask our citizens to reaffirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties. Passed by the Common Council of the Cannon Beach on the fourth day of September 18, 2018 by the following roll call vote. Thank you. Next item, <coughs> consideration of appointments to the Farmers Market Committee. The council wishes to appoint the applicant uh, for a second term. Oh boy. We can just use the ones here. Oh, I have. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we have a short break. Cue the short break music. Yeah. <laughs> Is Daryl here? He is. He's hiding in the corner. Right here. <laughs> We're going to make him give a speech and everything. <laughs> Can you sing a song for us, Daryl? No, not dance either. <laughs> I will just make some comments that the fact that um, Daryl and I show up every morning, every Tuesday morning for the farmer's market and get the stuff out there first thing and try and get as much done before <laughs> Philomena shows up. <laughs> it's always kind of fun. Uh, and it's m commendable that he's wanting to be on the committee also. And I'm he's like, still well, there he's when working. I show up at the end. And, and he's still there all day, yeah. <laughs> Fabulous volunteer. Mm -hmm. Wait, we haven't voted him in yet. <laughs> It says here you want to be on the emergency committee too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Thank you, Colleen. Secret ballot. Oh, secret ballot, yeah. You should put the remaining one. That's true. We need a motion to yes. approve this. I move that we appoint Daryl Christians as the um, me as member of the Farmers Market Committee. I second that. Colleen? Yes. Councillor Aye. Councillor Yes. Councillor McCarthy? Yes. Council President Yes. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Four to one. Okay. <laughs> That concludes our uh, public meeting. Uh, informational items, we monthly have, status. Uh, no. no. Bruce Menard grant. Next page. Bruce Menard. Oh, sorry. Off grant. Back up. Consideration 2018-2019 terrorism art grants. Bruce, do you want to introduce this? Um, yes, sir. The uh, <coughs> workshop, the council asked the uh, TAP group to take another look at the grants. Um, there was one that somebody came in and said we were changing the date and we wanted to ask for some additional funding. And it was remanded to them. I think that there were kind of two questions. One is, did you want to consider something like this? And then if you do consider it, what would your response be? And um, I think that almost by default, because somebody made a motion to deny taking the action, then they did consider it, and then they uh, voted it down. And so that's the recommendation back to you. Okay. Just to be clear, Bruce, they, they voted not to award the money to. Yes. The yeah, but they did. They did. They take a vote. Yeah. So they consider, yes, but they, they voted not to. I just a money. little, like you said, it's unclear. It was the motion was a, a yes vote. Yeah. That does not obligate you in any way. That was just you're asking for a recommendation. 
Okay. No. A motion. Any discussion or a motion or however the council wishes to go? I'd, I'd make a motion that uh, the council accept the uh, TAC committee recommendation not to increase the uh, TAP grant award for this coming year. Second. Second. Any discussion? On no. Okay. Colleen. Yes. Councillor Oldham. Yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Council President Benjamin. Yes. Councillor Bender. Aye. Mayor Yes. Okay. Now that concludes today's public meeting. Staff report or status reports. Um, I have nothing to communicate special. Any others? Chief, do you have anything special you want to announce? Uh, Thursday is our Burger with a Cop. We'll be having that over at uh, Cam Beach Vacation Rentals and in the fire bays of the fire department if it's going to be uh, raining, which I don't expect. But we have plenty of burgers and cake. And then we'll be doing a dog display uh, with Gunner. We're still working on raising money for a new canine vehicle. And actually, we've got some uh, great donations so far this year. Um, we're just trying to finalize that. But What time, Jason? It's 6 to 8. It's the interesting thing, uh, Joe was on vacation the last few weeks, and so I had the luxury of driving his vehicle uh, at one point and um, I don't know how he and Gunner tolerate it. I think that Gunner's worse off than Joe is. In the back it gets so hot they oh, have a okay. fan in there for the um, canine that they've actually uh, specially installed for the dog but it still gets warm in there and uh, cramped. Uh, so that's what we're working on for him. He's the priority for the I wanted to let you go first because we have a comp competing event. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Community Awards Grants uh, Potluck is at the chamber. Um, six o'clock? Six o'clock. Uh, and we will have more cake and pies. And <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention the clown? Okay. <laughs> well, we have a clown. Yeah, we well, have several of them. There's <laughs> old right back there. <laughs> Just bring your burgers and cake over to the potluck. Why don't you do that? Can we go to both? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, run back and forth quick. Colleen? Um, at the League of Oregon City concert at the end of this month, we need to designate who will be the, our primary voter at the board meeting and then also who would be the alternate. And in the past, the mayor has been Who's going? I'm going. Okay. You're going, Mike? And Nancy? I'm going. Yeah. You're going, Sam? Yeah. Well, I move that Sam be our primary voter. Well, we can't really go and through with the voter, but it's, um, yeah, but, but we have. Suggest. <laughs> you can do it by consensus. Okay. And who would be the alternate? Any volunteers? Oh, I'll do it. I intend to be there, so it shouldn't be a problem. And I always go to the board meeting anyhow, so uh, there we go. I wonder if Jason had any comments about the intersection at Hemlock and Sunset. We've had several public comments about that, uh, and I'm just curious uh, what's being looked at, what might be done there, uh, or if you concur with their observations. I think we should remove it. <laughs> <laughs> Roadblocks all the way around. Yes. Okay. No, uh, it's certainly a discussion we've had and it's growing uh, more and more. In fact, um, Sherry had brought it up to me recently and I think that whole corner there of businesses uh, has a concern for it and I said, well, you know, your best option is to take it to the council and bring it up. But, um, you know, it's the
the same concern that we have, I guess it was this last weekend was the second busiest weekend uh, that we had, you know, even over 4th of July and um, traffic wise. And so I always talk to my officers that are working during the weekend and they say, you know, we can go and stand down there, but there's nowhere for them to go. Um, it's just, uh, if we were to put in a stop sign uh, in both locations or in both directions there, then they proceed through the intersection and they're fine if they're headed southbound, but if they're headed uh, into Midtown, they're gonna run into two crosswalks right next to each other where they're stopping again. So it's just stopping every couple of feet. And I don't know if it would be something where we had a traffic study, you know, just monitored it. Um, because I think the concern that the bank and Brian with Beachcomber have is that people come around that corner and uh, you have people that are pulling from the bank. It's very similar to this intersection right here, mm -hmm. uh, which is really bad on uh, um, Tower. Yeah. Coolidge and, uh, on, and uh, farmers market days. Yeah. When you come around that corner, there's people in the street or there's cars pulling out slowly and you don't see them unless you know what to expect. And so um, I don't know that there's an easy solution for it. And I don't know that the solution would be putting in stop signs. So I would suggest a traffic <coughs> study on it, which is something that we had <coughs> talked about with the Telavana. Um, and I think that that's gotten better down there just with those white cones. I think it's helped a lot. I think that's alleviated that. And so I think I know how we could solve the problem. There was roundabout. Roundabout. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I've been, been too long already. <laughs> hey, I love those roundabouts. <laughs> those roundabouts are great. Yeah, they're, they're a trouble for a, um, pedestrians, though. It's hard to find a pedestrian place to get across safe. <laughs> that, that is a down, downside of the, of the roundabouts is pedestrians. Yeah. Mark, do you know if we're anywhere, uh, traffic study? We've tried that so many times to get the grant for that. Yes, well, sadly, I do know, and we got turned down for the third time. Um, I've talked to Karen Labonte, the public works director, about this, and um, just to bring her up to speed on it, she's talked to um, ODOT staff that have worked with us in the past, and there are a couple of options besides reapplying for a fourth time, and I, I told her flat out I thought reapplying for a fourth time really would be a bad idea, because uh, I, I don't know what we could possibly change. Um, but there are some other ways of getting funding for something different than a kind of the full combination plate of things we would do in a traffic uh, uh, transportation system plan. And one of them might be focused some targeted studies for a problem intersection, for instance. And ODOT does have some uh, discretionary money that they can move around for those types of purposes. Um, so that may be a, a way of, of getting at that particular problem. But I, I also think Jason's right. There is, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution to that that's, that's gonna jump out at us. But, um, you know, you, if you are gonna make a change there, uh, an informed change would be better than an uninformed one, and maybe that would be worth going forward on. And I understand that changing it just to test it is not a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on when we did it, but, you know, you do it during the summer, and it's gonna be a headache. Yeah. And you do it during the winter, and you're not really gonna get the results you want because you're not gonna see what would happen. There's also an unintended consequence that if you put them in, then it cars going north and south will stop every time on Hamlet. Yeah. And then again, as, as Jason was saying, when you've got the double crosswalks and things like that, that doesn't take into account, you know, if somebody has stopped and then made the turn, they're still going to run into other situations. One common denominator I'm finding throughout town is pedestrian. Or we could get a bunch of bridges. I knew you'd have a solution. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry it took me a while for the wheels to turn, but I got it. Okay. Anything else for good of the order? Well, change the subject. Um, rabbits. <laughs> have, have we learned anything about what we can do? I, um, there was something in uh, one of the uh, messages, I think, from Colleen, that we are going to look into what feasibility is there for the city to do anything. I believe that the city could get into the rabbit trapping business. 
Um, I don't know how successful we would be uh, and or what you would do with the rabbits or what kind of a reaction there would be. Um, my experience is that pretty much if you were to take a vote, it would be 50-50. I've done it with uh, Muscovy ducks and peacocks. And it's always half and half, and they're both adamant as far as their positions on it. So um, I think that it is possible. There's nobody else that would do the trapping. Uh, individuals can uh, get a trap and put it on their property, but uh, with the numbers that um, this lady's talking about, it would be very difficult to um, make a difference because even if you caught them all, your neighbor's got another bunch over here on either side of you. So um, it is a difficult situation and um, depends how much you know involvement we want to get into. Don't we have an ordinance against feeding wildlife? No, you proposed it, but it never passed. Never got passed. <laughs> so, and um, I got, I have some stories on that. I was going to talk about them tomorrow at the library. <laughs> <laughs> My experience with Muscovy ducks, yes. It is, it is uh, possible for a contractor to come in and, and do it per individual. There's individual no restrictions. I, I guess what I'm saying, there's no restrictions for somebody to, to right. hire out to be a trapper. We solved it on the north end by just bringing in the coyotes. <laughs> well, 30 years so ago, they came in by themselves <laughs> because the hunting was very good. Say, 30 years ago, the only rabbits that I know of in town were at the RV park, on the Sea Ranch RV park. There were rabbits there, <laughs> nowhere else in town. And they have uh, they moved around. Uh -huh. yeah. More than Carmen did. Yeah. Yeah. Terry. <coughs> I, I wanted to bring up something uh, which was in our, um, in our um, packet tonight. And it was uh, where we listed the, um, the things that you can, um, cannot discriminate on when it comes to housing. And um, there's only one that has to do with income. It says on source of income but it doesn't say anything about the level of income. Uh, That's right, yeah. So that seems to be something that we could limit if it's, at least it's not, um, I mean, they say source of income. They don't say level of income. And that was to prevent people from discriminating against people who were using housing vouchers mm -hmm. to pay the rent because there were landlords who would say, I right. won't accept housing vouchers for rent. And that took away right. that the ability of a landlord to turn down tenants based on housing vouchers alone. Yeah. What if well, you had a provision on affordable housing that said that it could not exceed the then current uh, housing allowance, HUD housing allowance, and, and we're not setting the price? Yeah, the housing allowance is, I believe, based on family size and income, and there's a equation and a table that results from that. Um, I. And I only know that from communicating with Todd Johnston at NOHA. So I, I, that's about the extent of my knowledge there. Yeah, maybe that's doable. I don't know. We can certainly ask. And How is every police monitored? Yeah. Well, well NOHA does maybe, it through. Maybe you know something about that. But yeah, we'll work, it, work with the IRS. NOHA requires an annual reporting. Yeah. So when you renew your lease, you bring in a copy of your tax return or something like that. And they reevaluate you every year. I mean, it takes it into the, you know, the realm of public housing, essentially. And I th I'd say it'd be problematic for anything that wasn't officially public housing to have that, that burden on it. I don't know how you'd enforce it. I don't know how you'd come up with any housing that <laughs> could be made available at that rate, but maybe it's some 20% or something. Mm -hmm. For that, rather than us getting into the administration. Yeah, and I, I guess what I've been hearing from Mark is that that's incredibly difficult to do. Well, when we were looking at the tiny homes in the RV park, we were uh, at least discussing spinning that whole part of the operation off to a contractor, presumably NOHA, that actually does that on a day-to-day -day basis for their own properties. So that would, you know, that would have made sense for that project. For other projects where there's another owner and we're just, uh, our role is limited to some financial incentives that we supplied at the time of the building permit, I'm, I'm a lot less certain about how that would work. Okay. Okay. 
I have a question on the um, communication from the Haystack Rock Awareness Program. Um, it says that 12 out of 17 nests left, uh, there are 12 out of 17 nests that are left in the seabird plot. And I just wondered if anybody knows what the seabird plot is. It's a new, it's a new term to me. Affordable so. housing. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, there. I'll find out and send you all an email. Okay. A spot where they're just counting. I assume it's a, you know, a, a group of, of nests that uh, have been designated as the seabird plot. <laughs> but I had not heard of it, and it was in here. And I did want to share one thing. Um, I went to a uh, city council meeting in Bend um, out of curiosity. And um, it, was, um, it wasn't a regular meeting. It was something they called a listening meeting. Um, and, and I think we would have called it a hearing, but they called it a listening meeting. And um, they had a committee that's been working for a year, um, and they're, they are uh, attempting to convert about 200 homes from septic to um, sewer, um, city sewer. And they've done this study to try and figure out how that can happen, and they came up with um, this proposal, the committee did, and, um, and there were, it was a, a citizen input night. Uh, about 100 people to show up showed up to protest. <laughs> The $25,000 per home that was being proposed that it was going to cost to switch those people from septic to sewer. Yep. So um, as you can imagine, it was a lively audience. <laughs> and these are almost all homeowners who, who were you know, faced with this $25,000 uh, startup. Okay, last chance for... I, I just want to make, uh, to let people know that there will be a candidates forum on October 4th at the uh, Coaster Theater. Starts, uh, doors open at 6.30, it starts at 7. RJ will be the uh, moderator for it. And I think everybody has been invited, all the candidates have been invited and have agreed to attend. And Sam will be there too. <laughs> He's unopposed, but... Whoopie. Probably will have something to say. Uh, and Daryl will be there too. October. <laughs> uh, yes. I just wanted to say I contacted uh, Milton Fire that lives on Ross Lane. And I would actually like to have a work session regarding at least uh, talking about how, how it could come about if the, the city and the residents of Ross Lane could come to some type of an agreement to, to get the street paved. You've done it many, many times. I know. <laughs> I'm asking. He gets the same complaint and the same answer for 14 years now. Okay. But um, that that so doesn't mean I'm not willing to uh, look at some, some new information or bring my sense of... Uh, have we discussed it since you've been on council? You have not. I'm happy to, to uh, bring it back for some discussion. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll put it on. <coughs> Maybe uh, October workshop. October. That's everything. We are adjourned. Thank you.